Good evening, everybody. Welcome to tonight's edition of the Triangle Area SQL Server User Groups Business Intelligence and Data Science Meeting. We have the pleasure tonight of having Mr. Paul Turley talk to us about Power BI, and especially once you get to larger amounts of data. So as not to have my voice crack any more than it already is, um, Shop Talk showed yesterday how, how sick I am, but actually not feeling sick at all, just, just still have the scratchy voice. But I'm going to save it and allow our star of the show to take over. So please, take it away. Hey, Kevin. Thank you very much. Appreciate uh, everyone attending. Uh, appreciate the invitation. Uh, we did this just a little over uh, a, a year ago. Uh, it, incidentally, Tracy and I had an interesting conversation a little over a month ago. I, I had a placeholder on my calendar to, to speak to your group. Um, uh, it was it was I think it was earlier in February, and uh, I was frantically trying to get a hold of Kevin and Tracy, saying, "Hey, I've got a placeholder on my calendar. I was supposed to be talking to you folks." And and uh, Tracy finally got back to me. She said, "No, it's it's in March, Paul. What are you thinking?" And it turns out that I I had actually put a placeholder on my calendar. I had mistyped the year, and it was it was for the previous presentation that I made. And uh, I, I I had 2023 instead of 2022, and anyway, it was it was kind of funny when we figured out what what I had done. It's my my old man brain. Uh, but um, anyway, just thank you, thank you so much. Uh, so Kevin and I just chatted a little bit. You you all are welcome to uh, ask questions. Um, just leave them in the chat. Um, Kevin's Kevin's going to to be the moderator. I'll I'll break at regular times during the presentation just to see if there are questions, but I fully expect you to have questions and uh, to make this as much as possible an open dialogue. I do have quite a few demonstrations um, that I'm, I'm prepared to show you. So let's get to that. So the, the title of the presentation is Using Power BI with a lot of data. Uh, this is a, a variation of a presentation that I gave at the past Data Community Summit in Seattle last year, uh, and, and a topic that I speak of just categorically uh, in, in different ways, um, you know, about uh, building large data sets, about uh, architecting Power BI solutions for the enterprise. Um, I come from an IT background. I've been working with business intelligence, data warehouses, and and uh, databases for um, a long time. But of course, BI has gone through a bit of a transition. And uh, today we, we recognize that there, there are different forms of BI. There's self-service BI, community BI, small group BI, and enterprise BI. And I, I still focus on the, uh, the enterprise story, uh, but uh, work with a lot of clients, work with a lot of people who have different needs in the BI space. So um, a little about me very, very quickly. You didn't come here to hear my, my uh, background, but you're welcome to connect with me. Um, I uh, try to be a, a, a little more social on, on Twitter these days, uh, taking a, a break from social media for a while, but uh, you're welcome to, um, to follow me on Twitter at, uh, at Paul underscore Turley. Um, my personal blog, SQL Server BI.blog, which is where I typically uh, we'll post my thoughts and and uh, material on this topic. You will find a copy of this presentation and uh, similar uh, content on my blog at sqlserverbi.blog, and you can also follow me on LinkedIn. Can't promise to get back to you right away, but uh, I will do my best to interact and answer questions. This slide is to help me remember what I signed up for and what to talk about, so we'll move past that one. And then you can find sample files and examples, as I said, on the presentations page on my blog. So actually, let me, uh, I, I thought I had uh, a bio page here, so I'll go back to this. Um, I've been a, a Microsoft uh, Most Valuable Professional for 13 years running now. Uh, also a uh, member of the Fast Track Recognized Solution Architect Program. Uh, uh, two years running and perhaps uh, th this year, we'll see how that goes. I'm also a member of Partner Voice. I'm a director of consulting services with Three Cloud Solutions. I have a, a, a team of developers who report to me. We have a practice of about 50 people who are focused mainly on Power BI development within our data and analytics consulting 
uh, group, which uh, we have about 200 people in the, the uh, data practice at 3Cloud. And uh, we're, we're, uh, we're all virtual. I'm working from my home in, in Battleground, Washington. If you don't know where that uh, is, that's okay. I'm, I'm about 20 miles from Mount St. Helens uh, in the greater uh, Portland and Vancouver, Washington area. So uh, enough about me. Let's talk about business intelligence. Um, there is a process to the way that we source and wrangle and move data through various phases and stages to get to the point where we can analyze data and provide reporting capabilities for business users. This process is very much like the way that you might construct a house. Now, I, I have two very active Australian cattle dogs and uh, I, uh, I, I'm, I'm, I'm afraid to use this word because one of them is watching me right now, but I walk them twice a day. Yes, she did look up um, a couple of times a day. And, and in the mornings, we've been walking through a neighborhood over the past, oh, six or eight months ago or so. I, I've been walking through this neighborhood that's been under development. There are uh, 37 units. And uh, as, as we walk through this neighborhood, something that I've noticed is that you will have a vacant lot. Pickup trucks will, will pull up in front of this lot and they'll unroll blueprints. And the contractors will, will kind of point and they'll look at where things should be. And, and uh, according to these blueprints, they'll then stake off the foundation footings. And uh, then after that, the next thing that we'll see is that they'll, they'll pour the foundation. And then they'll make sure that everything's lay, uh, level, make sure that everything is where it's supposed to be. And then they begin framing the home put up walls, windows, doors, the roof, and then eventually we'll actually build the home and then, of course, finish it with siding, paint, landscape, and then sell the house and somebody will move in. So this is a process that we're all familiar with, but it's not unlike the process that we would use to architect a business intelligence solution. You have to have a plan. You have to have scope. You have to have requirements. Can you iterate? Can it expand? Yes, to some degree, but we also need to understand what we're going to build, what we're trying to accomplish, what are our objectives, as well as what's outside the box. What are we not going to handle in this, this set of reports, this, this data model, and in this solution? So as we work through this process, it's important that we understand, understand our needs in terms of scale and volume and audience. Now, we're not going to talk through that process in depth, but as we talk about the enterprise side of Power BI, it's important for us to understand our objectives in terms of each of these steps. So, a reality check, super important. Embrace the technology that you're using. Understand what it was intended for and what it was designed for. Okay, use the right tool for the job. In the same way, going back to my construction analogy, you're not going to hammer in a nail with a screwdriver. You know, raise your hand if you've ever done that. You haven't had a hammer handy and you needed to pound in a nail. Maybe it's just to hang a uh, you know, a picture on the wall. And the only thing you had was a pair of pliers or a screwdriver. Not the most ideal thing. Can you do it? Yeah, to some degree. You're probably not going to try to turn a screw with a hammer. You're certainly not going to do any of those things with a chainsaw, but you really can't cut down a tree with a screwdriver either. So understanding the, 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 the tools that we're working with, understanding the needs that you have and the tools that might be most efficient to be able to provide for those needs is very important. So in that regard, it's important to understand that Power BI natively is optimized for analytical reporting and not for transactional reporting. So what does that mean? Well, if I need to create a shipping manifest or an invoice, a long list of stuff, Power BI may not be the most optimal tool for doing that kind of thing. If I need to see a lot of transactional details, again, may not be the right tool for that. Not that we can't necessarily force it, but so we can, we can manage very large data sets and transactional details using the right features of Power BI and in concert with other technologies. Another reality is that when we're talking about enterprise BI, we're talking about Power BI Premium. Lots of data, lots of users, Power BI Premium. 
And yes, there's a cost, but you're going to spend more money trying to beat Power BI Pro licensing or free licensing into submission if you have a lot of data and a large audience than you're going to spend on licensing. And that's an important realization. Using a star schema, building a data model with a star schema based on a star schema is nearly always going to be the right solution for analytical reporting. And import mode in Power BI is nearly always going to be faster than using direct query. Now there are exceptions, but import mode is king and trying to use uh, direct query, hybrid mode, and, 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 and other forms of, of storage come at costs and there are investments that you need to make. So wh wh why is this the case? You can see my, my slide format is odd there. I think my font changed. The VertiPak engine. It's important when you're working with Power BI to understand what the VertiPak engine is. Now, VertiPak was the, the internal name for the the data modeling engine, the in-memory analytic modeling engine that Power BI is based on. VertiPak uh, is behind uh, Power Pivot and Excel. It's behind Analysis Services tabular models. VertiPak has been around for a little while, and they leveraged that when they built Power BI. So VertiPak is an in-memory cache. Right, it's an in-memory engine, which means that data is pulled into memory and then it's compressed at a columnar level, each column is compressed separately. But when you're running a report, when you're interacting with a data model, that data is coming directly out of memory, which is one reason that it's very fast. Uh, a, a cached model can be refreshed very frequently, so it can be near real time. And we'll take a look at some ways that it can actually be real time. We have columnar level compression, and that that compression mode per column the actual technique used to compress that data can utilize a number of different encoding mechanisms. And we're not going to get into the weeds and how encoding works and exactly what that means. But the more that you understand about the architecture and the engine, the better prepared you may be to optimize your data so that it works most efficiently. All right. So if you need to optimize large models, go study the internal storage optimization. Understand different types of encoding. You don't have to be versed in it, but it will help you understand how to optimize. There are two different parts of the VertiPak engine. There is the storage engine and the formula engine. When we use the word storage, we're actually talking about memory. Sure, there's a PBIX file and it contains data. But when you publish that to the service, it actually ends up in a whole bunch of files sitting in solid state drive somewhere in a data center. But that data, again, is coming out of memory. So when we say storage, we actually refer to, to the data in memory. But then there's also a formula engine. So think of the storage engine as, as the back of your brain where your long-term memories are stored. And so if you need to remember something from your childhood, you know, your favorite food or Thanksgiving with the family, you, you can recall that very, very quickly because that's in storage. But if you need to perform a calculation and you need to think through a problem and you don't have the answer to that problem readily available in the back of your brain, the front of your brain has to work on it for a while. And that's what the formula engine does, is it, 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 it goes and gets stuff out of the storage engine, but it, then it has to do math and has to process formulas, and that can be more time consuming. Understanding how those two things work together will help you better optimize your data models. All right. This question comes up all the time. Now, I, I work with large consulting customers. So we sit down with a new customer at the beginning of a big project, and oftentimes one of the first questions that we have is, how much data do you have? And oftentimes the customer really doesn't know how much data we need to put into a data model. They can tell us how much data they have at rest. And oftentimes if I'm talking to a business stakeholder, they might say, well, I don't know how much data we have, but let's go ask the DBA, all right? So we sit down with the DBA and we say, hey DBA, how much data do you have? The DBA can typically give us an answer like, well, our data warehouse has one terabyte of data in it. Now, if you work for larger organizations with a lot of data, you can take any of these numbers, 
multiply them by 10 or 20 or 100, and these things will still work at scale. So let's say we have a terabyte of data in our data warehouse. We have hundreds of tables, and we have decades of history in some of these tables, and we certainly don't need to do reporting over all of that in one report page or in one data model. So let's say that that one terabyte of data, maybe there's 30 gigabytes of data in various tables and in select columns within those tables that we really need to fulfill a certain set of reporting requirements. All right, now we've got 30 gigabytes of data. We're going to apply compression against that. In a well-designed dimensional model, you can typically expect to get about 15x compression. Could be as low as 5x, could be as high as 30x. But we're gonna say 15x as a rule of thumb that takes our 30 gigabytes down to two gigabytes. And now my developer comes along and says, all right, well, I'm gonna suck two gigabytes of data into my PBIX file and then I'm gonna to try to deploy that to the service. Well, two gigabytes is still a pretty big PBIX file. So what we wanna do is use parameters and filter that data down to a small file. Now, if, if our developer had two gigabyte PBIX files, and let's say every couple of days or so, we, we have a new version, we have some new features that we need to, uh, to deploy, well, we want to check that into a source code repository. So if you're putting that in a, in a GitHub repo, or if you're putting it into uh, even a OneDrive for Business folder, two gigabytes is a pretty big file to do versioning against. So what we want to do is we want to pare that down very small. I'm going to show you how to do that. So we could typically get a one terabyte data warehouse selectively into a 100 megabyte um, PBIX file through this process that I've talked through. This is pretty typical. Okay, when we're talking enterprise, if you're using incremental refresh, if you have uh, large fact tables, um, you're typically going to want to use large data set storage in a premium workspace. So I would encourage you to switch that on in that case. And when you do that, you will not be able to download a data set as a new PBIX file which means that you need to make sure that those PBIX files are checked into a proper source code repository, which once again could be uh, OneDrive for Business. It could be as simple as just using SharePoint version control a la OneDrive for Business, or you could use a Git repo as long as you keep those PBIX files small. So um, there's really no negative impact for smaller data sets when you use large storage format. Um, but this is going to give you much better performance with larger data sets. Okay, so how much data can we actually store in a data set within Power BI? Well, entry level premium capacity is a P1. Now there, there are SKUs like, like uh, the, the A-class SKUs that, that, that are a little more conservative with this. But if you're moving up to premium capacity, and you start with a P1, the maximum size for each data model or data set is 25 gigabytes. That's a pretty big data set, big enough for most folks. We can go all the way up to a P5, and the maximum size is 400 gigabytes. Again, keep, my, keep in mind the compression, in the column selections that I uh, was talking about two slides ago, 25 is pretty big. Okay, so is, is enterprise, uh, is, is Power BI enterprise ready? You bet it is. All right, so how do we manage large data sets? And uh, so I'm gonna walk you through a couple of different options. We're gonna start by talking about date range parameters, and then later we'll talk about different ways of partitioning to manage large data sets. Okay, data source scale. Does the data source that you are using support query folding and direct query? This is a big, big question. It's an important question when working with large sets of data. Everything you see here on the left side of this, of this slide, File storage, CSV files in a data lake or in a file system, JSON files, CSV files, I repeated that. Um, a folder full of files, whether they're CSV files or uh, you know, Excel workbooks, if you're using a folder as a data source in Power BI, 
does not support query folding. Files in a data lake, when we treat those as files, doesn't support query folding. REST APIs will not support query folding. SharePoint OneDrive does not support query folding. Query folding means that when I create a query in Power Query, in Power BI Desktop, and when I go to process that query, to process all of those transformation steps, does the back end data source have the ability to receive that, that query as, as a native query? So if, if I'm connected to SQL Server or Azure SQL or Azure Synapse or uh, uh, data, uh, uh, Delta Lake in, in Databricks, there's an engine there. There's a, a, a processing engine that I can um, I can provide a, a, a SQL query that will be processed on the server side, and then only the results are sent back to, to Power BI. All of these data sources do support query folding, SQL Server, Azure SQL, any relational database engine, Spark sources, whether it's Databricks or Synapse or another form of Apache Spark, cloud-based data warehouses like Synapse Analytics, Snowflake, Redshift, Delta Lake, all of these data sources do support query folding, which is far more efficient when dealing with large volumes of data. All right, optimize for compression. Number one, eliminate wide text columns. You don't want your comment fields, your annotations stored in a data model. Well, what if you need to report on those things? We'll get to that. Store distinct values with low cardinality. Store numbers as numbers, not as text, and always use the most conservative data type. So let's take a look at an example. So in this column, I, I have decimal numbers. And let's say that some math was performed somewhere along the line in my ELT, my ETL, and uh, something was divided by something, and the resulting value is stored in a column in a file or a database. And as you can see, I'm, I'm storing this with 15 decimal precision, which means that I have to keep track of these little numbers way, way out here at the 15th decimal position. Because these three values are all unique, they're not compressible, all right? So there's, there's no opportunity to compress values in this column if they're all unique values. Now, if I convert this from a decimal number to a fixed decimal, that gives me four significant decimal positions. Now I have redundant values, and these are compressible. These three values can be compressed into one. That's going to save me some storage. Same thing here. These are compressed down to one value. This is going to compress much, much better. Let's say that I only need two significant positions. And so if I truncate or round these values, I now have even more efficient storage. So just using the most conservative data types can save you a lot of storage and speed things up quite a bit. Okay. I'm going to pause right there just because we haven't had a chance to, uh, to interact much yet. Before I get into my first demo, are there any questions? So if there are any questions, chat, uh, now's a great time to put them in. There was a comment in here about having never heard of VertiPack in all these years of using Excel, so good to know. Um, so yeah, that's, that is a good thing to know. Uh, so if there are questions, oh, there we go. So just never use direct query? Uh, that's, that, that is the $64,000 question. Um, I will answer that question a little later in the presentation. Um, but, but no, it's not quite that simple. Fair enough. And uh, the, the, the comment about, about VertiPack uh, related to Excel, VertiPack is used in PowerPivot which is an add-in for Excel. It's actually baked into new versions of Excel. Now, uh, back in 2010, 2013 uh, era, they, they, they added PowerPivot as, as, as an optional add-in that you could turn on in, in certain versions of Excel or certain editions of Excel. Um, now it's just available in, in every single version of Excel. I, I believe that that's true. 
um, as Microsoft have really tried to consolidate their products as, as they've offered the Microsoft 360, Microsoft 365 uh, uh, versions of all of the Office products now. But PowerPivot is, is now available. But it's not necessarily part of Excel. It's, it's PowerPivot. All right, well, let's look at this from the, the perspective of my developer. So I have a developer now who is going to be using Power BI, and he needs to create a manageable data set size. Now, over here, I have a data source that has some big tables that have hundreds of millions or billions of rows in them. And my developer is saying, I can't import all of that data and, uh, and manage these big PBIX files because I, I need to check them into source control. I need a disaster recovery plan. You know, I can't just put these on the C drive of my laptop that could be volatile. And, you know, what if I win the lottery and I need to pass the project off to somebody else? I, I can't do that when I'm just managing these huge files. So what do we do? How do we solve that problem? Well, our objective is to keep PBIX files small. We want refresh to be fast on the desktop while I'm developing. After I make a change, if I need to refresh a table. I don't want to have to wait 15 minutes for that to refresh. I need to be able to deploy it quickly. And that's hard to do with a one gigabyte file. It's a heck of a lot easier to do with a 100 megabyte file. Um, and I, I have the problem of, of CICD. And, you know, if, if, if you were to ask me two or three years ago, can we do CICD and DevOps with Power BI? The answer would have been mm, not very well. The answer today is, it's much easier than it used to be, and this is one of the keys, is to keeping these files as small as possible. All right, let's take a look at a demo. All righty, I have a collection of PBIX files that I'm going to progressively add features to, and we're going to, dis to explore different options for managing larger sets of data. So in this first example, I have a rather large fact table. So I'm going to, to view hidden tables here. And you'll see that, that I, I have uh, one, two, three, four fact tables. And we're going to take a look at fact online sales. I'm going to go to Power Query. I want you to, to notice that I have a measure here that keeps track of the row count in this fact table. And currently in this PBIX file, I have imported four and a half million rows into fact, on, uh, fact online sales. But at my data source, I have 21 million rows, just for demonstration purposes. And I don't wanna suck 21 million rows into the PBIX file here. So what I'm doing is I've created a range start and a range end parameter. You can see that those are, are date time parameters. I'm making a point to follow the guidelines to make this compatible with the incremental refresh feature of Power BI. And let's say that I don't need to use incremental refresh, but I'm making a point to use that pattern so that I always have that option. All right, so I've, I've got this, this, this range here. You can see that I, I currently have a year and, and three months in this, this span of, of range of dates between these two parameters. And the down here in my online sales table, I have added a date query, I'm sorry, a, a, a date filter um, using these two parameters. So I'm saying that uh, this date time type column, which I'm calling partition date time, which is really just a, uh, a, a, a copy of my uh, order date key converted to a date time is after or equal to range start and is before range end, okay? And that helps me keep this, this set of records down to four and a half million rather than 21 million. And in production, that might be, you know, hundreds of millions. It could be billions of, of rows. So that results in a PBIX file that is only 35 megabytes in size. Sorry, I had to dismiss the cat who's trying to get my attention. 35 megabytes in size. Okay, 
So I'm going to deploy this up to the Power BI service. So here's a copy of this data set that I've deployed. I'm going to go out to my settings. And I'm going to use that range start and range end parameter to open this range of dates up to include about five years instead of the year and three months that I had before. The result is that I now get my 21 million rows. Okay, I don't ever have to deal with a big PBIX file. I just have that 35 megabyte file. All right, any questions? All right, that's number one. If you have worked with SQL Server Analysis Services in the past, whether multidimensional or tabular, then you know that you can break your storage down using partitions. And this is this has been available for the past 20 plus years. We'd, we've been able to do this with, with um, analysis services. In the past, we've actually had to write either XMLA or TMSL script to do that. This is an example of, of TMSL script. You can see it's in, in JSON, which is actually a subset of uh, XMLA which, as the name suggests, was an XML-based standard rather, a, rather than a JSON-based standard. The good news is that you don't have to write this code anymore. You still can. You can still create your own partitions, and you can manage them manually if you want to. But these partitions shown in this screenshot were the result of a feature called incremental refresh, which, if I use the pattern that I just showed you, I will always have the option to implement incremental refresh, whether I'm using pro licensing or, uh, or premium licensing, just depending on the, the size of the data set. All right, so how is this done? Well, the first thing, and I'm gonna back up just a little bit, I need to make sure that in Power Query, I'm allowing parameterization. Once I do that, I create these two parameters. They have to be a date time. Now, that might seem silly. I just told you to use conservative data types. And in this case, we're using a date time data type to store a date only value. And my only answer to why is that necessary is that's the way they designed it. Um, and then I can create an incremental refresh policy on every table that has that date time partition key, which again, could just be a copy of, of an, an order date or a transaction date or an, an insert date, a, a date that doesn't change on a record, but um, is present when the record is, is inserted. And it really is as simple as this. So I, I'm gonna go show you uh, a, essentially a copy of this Power BI project. Now, let me get to my demo. So my database administrator is now saying, all right, we need to optimize and partition our large tables. We have a problem. You, developer, went and created this massive Power BI project. And import, it imports hundreds of millions of rows into a bunch of different tables. And every time the refresh runs in the middle of the night, the lights dim in my data center. All right, you're running these massive queries and it's, 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 it's really chugging the servers and that's a problem. And I know that most of our data doesn't change overnight. So why in the world are you going and fetching the same old data over and over and over again to refresh your data models? So we want to improve refresh speed. We want to prevent reloading history. We want the option to be able to capture updated history. So if an old record does change, we do need to reprocess that and we want to reduce the database resource load. So my DBA is saying, hey, developer, go fix this. And that's what we're going to do. So let me jump over to my next demo. And while we open that up, I'm going to dismiss the cat from the office. I'll be right back.
This is one of the wonderful things about having a home office is that we get to coexist with our animals. Um, all right, so same scenario as before. As you can see, nothing has changed. I'm still using the same range of dates. I'm still reducing my data set down to a fraction of uh, the, the volume that it could be. But after using those two parameters, I'm going to go to my fact online orders table. I need to view hidden. Right there. And I'm going to implement an incremental refresh policy. Okay. So here I'm saying what I want to do is I want to go back five years. And starting five years ago, I would like the Power BI service to generate partitions that hold one year's worth of data. Five years ago, four years ago, three years ago, two years ago, one year ago. But in the last two months, I want you to create monthly partitions. And every time we refresh, with the exception of what I'm going to explain afterward, do not go back and reprocess those old yearly partitions. They're already populated. I don't expect that data to change. Leave them alone. But do reprocess the last two months worth of monthly partitions. Now, this will generate more monthly partitions than two, and it'll keep track of all of those, but it's only going to reprocess the last two months. Now, we can ignore this feature for now, but I've actually enabled yet another feature that, that says within the last fraction of a month, since we are technically still in the month of, of February, I want all of February to be a direct query partition, which means that I'm actually going to go back to the data source as the, the user interacts with the report. It's not what we're talking about right now, but that is a feature. It is a premium only feature. Um, and then I want to detect changes as well. I have an update date column in each of my fact tables. And if an old record gets updated, then that update date uh, value changes. And the service is going to go use that to go figure out that, hey, there's this record in a three-year-old partition that changed. Go reprocess that three-year-old partition so that we can capture those changes as well. So if we were to open a tool such as Tabular Editor or SQL Server uh, uh, Management Studio, Tabular, if I can spell. And you can use the free version of Tabular Editor as well. I can actually go and look at my published data set. So if we go take a look at the data set where I have uh, implemented incremental refresh, and I've processed that, which took a while to build those partitions the first time. If I go down and take a look at my online sales table, here you can see all of these partitions. So there are my yearly partitions, and then there are uh, quarterly partitions and monthly partitions. It was smart enough just to build all of that for me. All right. And I could process each of these individually if I wanted to manually. Any questions as I switch back to the slides? I just wanted to make sure of one clarification there, and I think, um, I believe you've already answered it, but um, <clears throat> the question that did come in, so the suggestion here was to trim down data using parameter publish and then increase the parameters over time. Um, so if, if you don't need to partition, if you don't find the need to use incremental refresh, you can use those parameters just to expand that date range. If you do use incremental refresh, then you forget about the, the parameters and the service takes them over and it just magically does all this for you. Makes sense. And there, yeah. there was another question that I uh, did want to ask here and you might you might have an answer for it in a little bit, but it, supposing that you have a lot of data that's in a cloud storage solution, is there a particular cloud storage solution that you would recommend for uh, dealing with Power BI? Uh, why, yes, the Microsoft Cloud. Um, 
I, I, I would, I, that's a big question because there are a lot of options. Power BI will work with a, a lot of different data connectors and a lot of different data sources. Um, you know, if, if you're a Snowflake shop, we can work with Snowflake. If you're a Redshift shop, we can work with Redshift. Now, are, are you going to have a real seamless, uh, you know, easy experience if you use a Microsoft product with, with an AWS product? Probably not as seamless as if you were to use uh, you know, Azure SQL or Synapse Analytics. Um, I, our go-to at 3Cloud, when, when a big customer comes to us and says, we need to move to the cloud, what do you suggest? Um, first of all, we're going to look at their requirements and look at, at uh, you know, the, the, the applications that they're using and try to make an informed decision. But we're typically going to recommend Synapse Analytics using uh, a data lake to, to create, you know, medallion storage as, as we move data in, in, you know, from CSV files to Parquet into a, a Delta Lake that has a, a Spark engine over the top, and then perhaps relational storage. If their storage needs aren't that great, then Azure SQL is probably a, a cheaper option. Um, but, you know, if they have a massive amount of data and a lot of query needs, then perhaps Synapse Analytics. Um, the other option within Azure is, is Databricks. Databricks is a slightly more mature platform. It's a little more expensive. Um, I, I, I will tell you cautiously under NDA that uh, if you continue to watch the Microsoft story, that we can expect Power BI and Synapse Analytics to continue to evolve into something um, much greater than it is today. Um, so that's that that's my very high level answer. But uh, it, it depends on how much data you have, and it depends on um, you know how much you need it to scale. Excellent. Any, and one any oh, other questions in that category? Yeah, there was one other question, and that was, uh, what. so what do you do if date ranges are relative to the current date? Like, I care about the last 18 months from the beginning of this month. That's what incremental refresh does. That's exactly what it does. Perfect. So when, when, yeah, when you define this policy, uh, and I believe I closed tabular editor, but... Um, you know, th this is all relative to the current date. In fact, if you, you just look at the, the description down here, it says that, that, that this is going to result in, um, you know, uh, in incremental refresh. Uh, this is going to result in parameters or partitions that include this range of dates. In fact, there's a chart down here at the bottom that that, that shows you what that means. So relative to today's date, we're going to have this partition that's direct query. We're going to have these partitions that are incremental. We're going to have these partitions that are archived. And if you have a, a, a processing event every night, this is always relative to the current date. So it, it just magically works. Excellent. That'll do it. All right. Well, what's this other than some real fine print that's hard to read? This is a big, wide table. And this is a paramount rule. If, if I can reinforce any other best practice, uh, in any one best practice in Power BI, it's that you should avoid big, wide tables. And then you should design your data models using a star schema. So this kind of begs the question, well, well, well great. So you say, I, I shouldn't have wide tables and I shouldn't have text columns, but I have reporting needs where I need to have those text columns. I need to have all of these columns present. Just don't put it in your semantic model. And I'll show you some ways that we can work with that. So the star schema is king. Every Saturday morning, with rare exception, Adam Saxton and Patrick LeBlanc, AKA Guy in a Cube, host a, a, a live stream on YouTube. And uh, it's at 7.30 my time, 10.30 your time, AM, Saturday mornings. Um, 
And, and I would say that a good third of the questions of, hey, I'm trying to write a DAX query that does this and I have these business requirements. How do I make this happen? A, a third of the time on average, the answer is you need to build a star schema that supports that requirement. And then the DAX is going to be simple. And then the report design is going to be simple. Again, Power BI is all about analytic reporting. Analytic means star schema, dimensional modeling. And that fact table in the middle can't be this big, big, fat, wide table. It just doesn't work. All right. But the business users say, OK, well, that's all well and good that you're saying your tool is not optimized for my needs. But we need to see the details. OK, I want to be able to I don't need to see all the details for you know 100 million records. I need to see the details for the records that I care about. This month sales, my territory, this date, this week, this month, whatever it is. So we want to be able to drill down in context. We want to see transactions. We want to see detail records. And we also want to see recent data changes. All right. If I'm working in a CRM system and I've just promoted an opportunity from, you know, level one to level two or into a customer or into a real project, I want to be able to see that change minutes after I've made it. So how do I accomplish that? All right. So let's take a look at what happens when I import a big wide table. Let me close desktop before I do that. Now, one of the first things that you're going to notice is that this is going to take a lot longer to open. And I'll just point out while we're looking at this little splash screen here, look at the size of that file. Let me jump back there since I started down this road. Look at the size of this file. We've gone from 35 megabytes to half a gigabyte to almost 500 megabytes. And the way that we did that was by importing this inventory details table. So that table has 12 million rows in it and it's a big wide table and you can see you can see columns in here like descriptions i've got geographic data so there's geopoints geolocations look at this product description big wide text columns lots and lots of text columns just lots and lots and lots of columns. Now, this is this is only a dem demo data set. I work with customers who will bring us a, a table with 600 columns. And they'll say, I need to import this into Power BI. And when we do that, bad, bad things happen. All right, but that, that's what we've done here. So I'm going to go to my report page. And uh, here's my inventory details uh, page here that actually contains those transactional details. And I'm going to go down here to computers for the month of January. I'm going to right click. I've created this drill through action that will take me to that page and pass some parameters. So this is passing my month and my uh, occupation and my year and my product category. But you can see that that was really quick. So the good news is that I got very fast response, which I'm used to seeing in Power BI. The bad news is that my, my model has become so big that we can no longer check it into source code control. It's too big to deploy. Sure, I, I could go filter it and use parameters like I did before, but it, it it's just cumbersome and it's difficult to manage. And users are going to start introducing more requirements. They're going to say, hey, can you go write a measure that, that gives me, you know, a rolling 12 month average variable something and it's going to be very very difficult to do that because my model is becoming very very complex all right so we've created this problem for ourselves and that's all right direct query to the rescue so direct query means that i don't have to import that data and direct query is great if I have a fairly conservative table, and maybe it has billions of rows in it, that's fine because I'm not going to import them. But let's take a look at what might happen if I did the same kind of, of drill through against a, a direct query table. So um, let me get to my demo slide right here. And I'm going to... Oh, 
open up that PBIX file with drill through. We're back to 35 megabytes. That's, that's I'm sorry, uh, 35 megabytes. So that's good news. And it opens pretty quickly in desktop. All right, let's go back and uh, take a look at well, my fact tables. There's my, my inventory details. I can't preview it because I haven't imported any data. It's not going to run a query against direct query and show me a preview. It just says, hey, you're using direct query. Uh, you'll see this in the report. You can't preview it here. All right, let's go to my report page. Same thing as before. I'm going to go to computers. I formatted this page just a little bit differently, but it's the same data. So there's computers for January. I'm going to right click, say drill through. That's going to pass the same parameters to that target page, but this time it's actually running a SQL query and we wait. And now is a good time for questions because we're going to be waiting a little while. So if there are any questions, uh, let's get them in. How many people do we have attending so far, Kevin? So that's something that I'll actually know after the fact. Um, Twitch shows me right now a rough number of people viewing, but I've found that isn't really accurate. So um, the current viewer count isn't always correct. Mm -hmm. So I, I have made a point to kind of create a problem that I'm then going to show you different ways to solve. But right now, as you can see, we have a significant performance problem. Uh, this query, just depending on other factors, typically takes somewhere between 45 seconds to a minute to run. And uh, needless to say, our users are not going to be very happy with that. So our users are saying, oh, great. All right. You, you, uh, you checked the box. You gave us a feature that met the requirements. So good. We've got this, this, this report page that I can drill through to. But it takes forever, and I have to go make coffee every time I want to see my transaction details. So how can we speed that up? Let's see if we're there. Okay, we got the table back so far, but uh, I have three bar charts here that are still running their respective queries. This should come back there. There's the first one. So that one rendered. It's like watching paint dry. And those rendered. So I, I, I wasn't watching the clock, but that took well over a minute for those four queries to run and bring back those details. Again, for category name computers, month, January, year 2021. It just passed those three parameters, which, of course, generated a where clause and a SQL statement. But it's just an optim not an optimized data source. And so, you know, as a, as a database administrator, as a database developer, you might say, well, hey, let's go materialize the view. Let's, let's put an index on it. Sure, that's going to speed things up a little bit. It might speed things up a lot. You know, and so maybe my minute-long query can be reduced to 10 seconds. 10 seconds is still a long time in, in the Power BI world. So what can we do? Let me close my PBIX while I'm thinking about it here. What can we do to speed this up? All right, so I want the best of both worlds. I, I like direct query. I, I like that, that in that transaction view, I saw the record that I just updated because it was actually doing a live query against that data source. Um, but um, I also would like to see the kind of interaction and the speed that we get with import mode when we're aggregating and grouping data together. So what can we do? And the answer is that we actually go get the data twice. We use direct query for our transaction level details, which gives us all of those advantages at the cost of performance. And then we can go tune our database and do other things to try to improve performance. But then we can also import an aggregated version of that same data. Now, 
you might think, well, wait a second. Now, if I've got records that are being updated and then I'm importing a copy of that data, could there be a lag? Could there be a discrepancy between those two views? Yes, there can. And that's a trade-off when you're using aggregations. But let me show you how aggregations work now. The whole idea behind aggregations is that I, I am going to keep two copies of my data, or at least two different views of the data. So um, one thing you'll you'll see here is that my PBX file is growing in size. I've I've doubled it from 35 megabytes to 71 megabytes. These are fairly small file sizes, but this is also demo data. And so what I've done is if we go down to the model view, you'll see that I have my inventory details table here. This is a direct query view as evidenced by the blue header. So the different color indicates that that's a different storage mode. Um, you can also see these broken lines in the relationships, and that means that that's not a hard relationship. If I have a relationship between a direct query table and an import table, there is no way for me to force referential integrity and to force the cardinality rules in Power BI against those tables in different storage modes because it's not being done in a, in a relational engine. I'm nearly suggesting that there are certain rules that we should play by, but it's possible to violate those rules. I could have duplicate keys and you know, other things that SQL Server may not you know, allow if this were within a, a relational database. But then I also have this other version of the table, and this is based on a view that uses a SQL group by. So I'm saying group by inventory date, product key, and store key, and then give me the sum of on-hand quantity and on-order quantity. So that view returns this aggregate set of data. And then if we go over to, uh, I always forget which, which direction to do this, and I believe that we design aggregations here. Manage aggregations, yes, okay. Uh, <laughs> nope, did it wrong. Manage aggregations. All right, so what I've done is I'm saying, all right, as my user is navigating through my data, if they happen to be grouping by the inventory date, product key, and store key, then go to the inventory summary ags table and return the sum of on-hand quantity and on-order quantity. That's going to be against that import mode table. However, if the user is browsing or navigating my data through a report that is not grouped at this level, then go to the inventory details table and use direct query, which of course I'll, I'll suffer the performance penalty that we saw earlier. So again, it, it's, it's a balancing act. It's the best of both worlds, but there's also the trade-off between those two worlds as well. Okay, um, I'm not going to demonstrate that because demonstrating the direct query version would mean that we would get to sit and wait for another minute, and I'm not going to do that to you. All right, well, let's close this. Now, um, once you start introducing advanced level features like aggregations, it means that things can get a little more complicated. And we can design for different aggregation scenarios, and it's often easy to, to you know, have bugs in our design. When I did this the first time, I found that my aggregations weren't working correctly. And the reason that I was doing that is because I, I now had two different copies of some different columns. In particular, um, I was grouping uh, in a report, I was grouping on the region country name column, but I was using the column for my inventory details table. And uh, because of that, it, it didn't hit my aggregations and I didn't get that fast performance. Um, I, I, I started doing some web searches and looking for some help on, on how to figure out how to get aggregations working. I came across a guy in a cube video that Patrick LeBlanc had done a couple of years ago, and he actually demonstrated this, this same scenario. And he, he showed how to capture the DAX query using the performance analyzer in Power BI, Power BI Desktop 
for a visual and then copy and paste that visual into DAX Studio. And then you can turn on server timings and figure out if it's hitting your aggregations. And in this case, you can see that attempt failed down here. And it told me why. It said, oh, you're using the wrong table. And then that was easy to figure out once I knew what the problem was. So again, you're, you're adding compl com some complexity. And that means that you should expect there to be iterations of debugging and troubleshooting. So use these features cautiously and make sure you give yourself some runway to do the appropriate debugging and troubleshooting. Okay. Uh, there, there is a feature called auto aggregations or auto ags. And what that does is it allows the Power BI service to go figure out what aggregations to recommend, then it will automatically add those aggregations. It does that in the service. It's a very advanced feature, but uh, essentially this is aggregations on steroids. Christian Wade has blogged and, and done presentations on this feature. It's a pretty cool feature when you're using very, very large data sets, but keep in mind this is all done in the service. All right, and this is one of my, my, my favorite things, and that is Maybe that big wide table just shouldn't be in my data model at all. Maybe it would be best to go get that data directly out of my Azure SQL database and read from that view or from that query rather than pulling that in my data model. And that is a job for paginated reports. So how can I drill through from a Power BI interactive report to a paginated report. Now let me pause a little bit and uh, just mention that paginated reports is the new name for SQL Server reporting services as it, it is integrated into the Power BI service. So if you've used SSRS before, and uh, I a lot of my career is kind of based on writing books about SQL Server reporting services, which today is a fairly antiquated tool. But the product team have, have, have implemented a, uh, an addition of SQL Server reporting services in the Power BI service. And uh, as of about uh, six months ago, you, you only need a pro license to use it. It used to be a premium only feature. But uh, we can use paginated reports for transaction level reporting and use Power BI for interactive reporting, and we can have the best of both worlds. And this is how this works. So within the Power BI service, <clears throat> I'm, I'm gonna publish this RDL report. Let me open this up. That'll open up um, Power BI Report Builder, which is the addition of Report Builder that's that's optimized for Power BI integration. So this is, this is appears to be plain old report builder that you would you would get if you were using reporting services. This is a, uh, a simple table-based report. You can see I'm not doing any grouping or anything, but I do have three parameters here. Like before, I have a product category parameter, a year parameter, and a month parameter. And my data source is Azure SQL. I'm just going directly to my Contoso DW database and my data set, this is data set per the definition of paginated reports, which means query. My data set looks like this. I'm saying select star from this view where, and then I'm using those parameters in the where clause. So no DAX here. I'm not using a Power BI data model. You can use a Power BI data model for a paginated report, but in this case, I don't want to because I don't want to complicate that data model. So. I deploy that paginated report up to the Power BI service into a workspace. And then here in my Power BI report, I have to have the path or the address to my paginated report. I'm gonna go get that. So there's my uh, my paginated report right there. Now, if I go run that report, I can just go grab this address out of the address bar. You can see that the, the report, uh, that's my workspace. Here's my report is just this, this GUID, this ID. I'm just gonna capture that to the clipboard. 
I'll need that to do what I'm going to show you. I like to keep my configuration information in a table, which is what I've done here. I'll show you where I've done that really quickly. So if I go to edit the query, what am I having? Why am I struggling here? Because I'm clicking on the wrong thing. All right, edit query. And I'm just going to use the enter data feature to create this report configuration table. And you can see what I've done is, is I've really just pasted this. Oh, sorry. Convert to table. What have I done here? Anyway, I, I so I, I used enter data and I just created um, a column called uh, inventory report path and I just pasted that. Oh, I see, I get it from a parameter. Um, so I put that in a parameter and then I built a table based on that. That lets me create a measure. And that measure is right here. So the purpose of this measure I've run Zoom it since I rebooted my computer last time. So let me do that real quick. So I'm going to go get that path that uh, I've surfaced through this measure. All right. And then I'm going to concatenate together a web URL with some query string parameters. And I'm going to say product category equals the name of my selected product category. So in my report, if I have one category selected, it's going to return that value. I'm going to concatenate the year. I'm going to go get my year value. I'm going to concatenate the month parameter. I'm going to get my month name. And we can see the results of this if I hover over this link. And there you can see the entire URL with all of those, those parameters um, uh, concatenated to the end. Now, I, I do have a demonstration of this on my blog. I have a PBIX file that you can download um, where you can see all of this working. But you can see mechanically what I'm doing is I'm just generating this link. And then I go and I set the data category for this measure to a web URL. That makes it a link. And then there are a variety of visuals that I can drag and drop that measure into, and it'll just display a link. All right, so let's jump up to the service where I have deployed this report. So that's that guy right there. And much like we did before, I'm going to go down to computers for the year 2022 for January. There's my link. I click. Now, still running a query against this database, which is running an Azure SQL with a very, very conservative um, capacity. And so it's not a really super fast performing database. So I don't want it to, to cost me much to leave it running. Um, but you can see that it's taking a while. Now I'm passing uh, computers as the product category. I'm passing 2022 as the year and I'm passing January as the month. You can see that paginated reports does me the favor of showing me how many records it's fetching. It's going to go get, uh, what was it, 70,000, 40, okay, maybe 48,000. All right, and there's my first page. Look how many pages I have, 1,415 pages of data. You can't do that with Power BI, and if you find a way to do it, you shouldn't. So best of both worlds, interactive Power BI report, no transaction details to complicate my model, but then I can drill through to details and I can have all the transactional details that I want in this paginated report. All right, any questions? Uh, no questions at the moment. All right, you guys are kind of quiet. All righty, so getting to a summary. So, so do you need to learn all this stuff? Do you need to add all of these features to your Power BI projects? No, no, you don't. I would say that if you have even moderately large fact tables in your 
dimensional models that can be partitioned by date, I would highly recommend that you use the date range parameter technique. Okay. Go look up on Microsoft Learning, learn.microsoft.com. Go look up the incremental refresh um, instructions. It's simple, it's four or five pages. And it's going to show you how you create that range start and range end parameter as a date time, and then use that to create a date range filter on your large fact tables. Make sure that those fact tables implement query folding. Okay, use a view, not an inline SQL. Don't do all of your joins in a SQL statement that you paste into Power Query. Do that in SQL Server, create a view, and then you'll get query folding and better performance against that view. You can even use stored procedures. Uh, Patrick uh, uh, posted a, a recording a little while ago about how to use stored procedures. I would strongly recommend using views as your, your main method. If you have very large tables, your PBIX files are growing, it takes a long time to refresh them on the desktop, then you can graduate to implementing incremental refresh. And beyond that, these are all additional techniques that you can use. And if you need transactional reporting in concert with Power BI interactive reporting, and then you can use paginated reports using a technique similar to what I've shown you. So, um, that's it. That's what I have to show you. Um, what I will do, though, is uh, take this opportunity to promote my blog just a little bit. Um, let me uh, grab another browser window here. Type. SQL Server BI blog. Um, these are the topics that I, I typically blog about. As you can see, I, I, I talk about, you know, why don't people use dimensional models? Uh, if you go to any expert and say, hey, how do I optimize my Power BI models? They're going to say, well, make sure that you start with a, a dimensional star schema. There are reasons that, that people think that that's hard to do or that that there may be blockers. So that was my, my most recent blog. Um, DevOps and CI CD. I actually have a, a, a guest blogger who's going to be blogging about doing um, uh, complex and proper DevOps using Power BI. We've done a number of DevOps projects lately. And then uh, developing large Power BI data sets. This three part series is, is pretty much based on this presentation. If you go to presentations, you will see uh, this deck and demos and samples. I don't have all of the samples because there were some large PBIX files that I can't host on my blog site. Um, but uh, this is where to go to actually be able to play with this stuff. And then I have some other presentations and links to YouTube videos as, as well. So if you have additional questions, I can stick around and, and answer them. Again, you're welcome to reach out to me. And uh, I'm, I'm happy to answer your questions offline. I, I won't offer free consulting, but uh, I'm happy to interact and help folks out as time allows. All right. Thank you, Paul. If there are, <coughs> excuse me, if there are any questions, please get them into chat. This is, we'll uh, vamp for just a moment here so that if you have a question, you might even just say, hey, got a question. And that way you can buy me a little bit of time and I'll buy you a little bit of time. And we'll buy each other some time. And that way uh, you'll be able to get your question in in a rather it, convenient It's fashion. only just after four o'clock my time. So I, I, I have more time than you do. <laughs> so, so far, no questions. I think that uh, we might have, you might have gotten them all. Okay. Well, that's either the sign of a good presentation where I've answered all the questions or just one where everybody's really bored and they uh, <laughs> want to move on. So I'm hoping it's the former, not the latter. I'm going to call it a good presentation. Uh, well, thank you, Ken. I appreciate it. All right, everybody. Well, if there are no questions, then let's wrap things up for this evening. Uh, thank you again to Paul Turley for a great presentation. And... Uh, that is going to wrap us up for the month. Obviously, we're at the end of the month. But next month, 
second Tuesday, we're going to have our advanced DBA meeting. Third Tuesday, we'll have our main meeting. Fourth Tuesday, data science, business intelligence. All of them available, meetup.com slash tripass. And until we see each other again, everyone, take care. Thanks, everyone.